So this is Dr. David Bell standing next to me. He's the medical director of the Young Men's Clinic and the school-based clinic program at the Center for Population and Family Health at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. A physician who specializes in adolescent medicine, Dr. Bell works primarily with young people aged 12 to 24, including providing direct health care services to adolescent men and women. He's a member of the Editorial Advisory Committee for the Peer Review Journal Perspective on Perspectives on Sexual and Reproductive Health, and has worked as a consultant for the Allen Guttmacher Institute and in Gender Health. He's a former medical director for three school-based clinics associated with St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospitals in New York City. He received his medical degree from UT Southwestern in Dallas and completed his pediatric residency at NYU Bellevue Medical Centers. Uh, he also completed a fellowship in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at, at UCSF and has an MPH from UC Berkeley with a focus on adolescent issues. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Bell, who's going to be speaking on the other half of the equation, talking to males about re reproductive health. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to thank, thank uh, Dr. Zabrigan. Uh, for such a provocative um, lecture that I've been s struggling with how to bring some of those concepts into my daily sort of work with adolescent males. Um, in the international world, uh, there are lots of work that's being done about gender equality and gender transformation, but it's mostly in group work, and it's about sort of, it's trying to get guys to understand sort of sexualization uh, on a on a sort of personal level and a group and having group norm changes. But I, th I guess being in uh, the United States and having um, sort of our risk model, it's, it's interesting to try to change how we talk to males or anyone actually uh, in, in easily given what, we, what information we need to get, what information, how we're taught to do our risk assessments and what have you. That being said, uh, the, in the public health world, there's also the idea of bringing pleasure into the conversations a lot uh, more than we have, and how we do that with males also is a struggle. The, I think most people have trouble talking to males for the most part because it's less likely that you're going to talk about reproduction and you are going to be talking about sex, and that sort of makes many people more uncomfortable uh, across the board. My my talk today actually is a challenge. It's a, it, this year has been a challenge for the most part, uh, helping me to understand what I do and how I interact with males. And so this was sort of a push for me to at least start that conversation with myself and now with you. Um, the first challenge this year was I did a four hour, two four-hour workshops in Texas uh, with male models and uh, sort of training uh, nurse practitioners and other clinicians in the Title X uh, family planning world about seeing males. And so we had a group of males, about four or five, that were sort of for interviews and another group of four or five that were actually being uh, paid to do the exams uh, just as we have female models. And it was an interesting experience as the first time that it really led uh, a workshop like that, and particularly with the interview process, um, and I'll get more to that in a second. But first off, let me disclose that I know Merck supported this. I actually must disclose I'm on the male advisory board, particularly for the HPV vaccine, and it's universal, as you may know, uh, for guys uh, ages 9 to 11, so that's a great thing, in my opinion. Um, and otherwise, th but that has nothing to do with my talk, I will say. <laughs> so, so our learning objectives today are to uh, utilize at least two strategies to obtain an accurate, and sexual, accurate sexual and reproductive history for males. Know and use certain words and approaches to build alliance and enhance the interaction and conversations with males in their visit. And then sort of with, because it's hard for, I'd say, clinicians to do our work in our risk-based model without asking risk questions. I wanted to at least bring in um, the what the CDC 
structure of our questions are, uh, that are suggested with a twist about some other questions that we might ask guys to help them uh, be self, more, more self-reflective about what's going, what has gone on in their sexual and reproductive life to date. So overall, uh, for males, we must say that um, starting in adolescence, males use health care less often than females. Uh, after the age of 15, uh, guys drop off uh, from seeing males of uh, primary care providers on a regular basis. So we have a challenge in sort of how we connect and have these conversations in general. Um, but, and we sort of talk about masculinity uh, in a context of blaming guys they, they want, you know, they're not coming in because they're too macho. But I also think that as, an inst as our institutions and as we approach males as well, there are many different ways we create barriers for males to approach us and to talk with us. Um, my, the Young Men's Clinic, I would say, um, we've been challenged also in, in the last year to expand. We got um, monies from the Robin Hood Foundation in New York City and we went from a three, three and a half day clinic um, to a five day clinic, or actually three half days, uh, to five days. And in, within the year, we've grown by 60%, which is fairly phenomenal, I'd say, across the board for uh, growth. And in one case, um, I, we haven't, I haven't seen that I've replicated this before, but I had 26 patients scheduled for one Thursday, one of the, after three weeks of um, opening a Thursday in, in our expansion. And I had a 100% show rate. And it was fairly phenomenal. It was like at the end of it, I went to all the staff and said, we had 100%. This is fantastic. And so it, it does say it, something's happening really well uh, for the Young Men's Clinic. And I'm not, I can't, I don't understand it all. One is sort of opening the doors. But I th also think that many of the guys will say that once they leave, because of the front desk staff from the medical assistants to our social workers, to our health educators, to our nursing staff, and hopefully clinicians as well, uh, that we treat them with respect, we communicate with them, and answer questions hopefully in a way that they can respond to. And it's one way I can sort of think about our approach is a strength-based approach, approach. And it's not that we aren't asking about the, the risk, but we're asking it about it in a different way that allows conversation. And so as a proponent of a resiliency model, uh, we're not, not being blind to risk. So every, if everyone's, is everyone familiar with re the resiliency model? So oh, just to make sure, um, resiliency model is sort of, in sense, the opposite of the risk model. And that we, what it says is that adolescents that connect to X, and that connection can be to their parents, it can be to their church, it can be to a goal in their future, whether it's to be a basketball player or whether it's to be president or whether it's to go to college. In any number of sort of next connections helps mediate the risk in their lives uh, so that they can be m more positive and more engaged and sort of uh, help them be more resilient. Um, and so in that context, connecting from a strength-based model and a strength-based approach is about creating that connection. Uh, and it builds on the strengths that you can sort of hear uh, that in, your st in their stories to you and that you can reflect back to them so that they understand in, in a different way what they're going through. Um, I, a story comes to mind from a patient that I saw, and he, was, he came in, he was depressed, he was worried, and he actually did have his goals and that he was setting for himself and was trying to achieve them. But he, all he could focus on were the setbacks that he had experienced. And when I was able to say, let's step back, this is what you accomplished in, in the last five months that uh, you've been, you set through the goal. Yes, you did have this setback 
and you're not exactly where you want, but look at what you achieved in these last five months. And when he was able to sort of sit back and hear what I said, he goes, you're right. I did X, you know, five things that were right on target. And then I made a decision that changed the direct direction of where I was going, but I actually was on target for where I was going. And so helping him understand that and recognize it, I think, was a powerful piece for him to see how, how powerful he was that he could move something forward and that he was attaining his goals. So in, in the strength-based approach, the goal of the relationship is we do focus on sexual and reproductive health in uh, the Young Men's Clinic. We do primary care, but our focus is on sexual and reproductive health. And I've always thought that one of our goals that's different from an STI clinic in New York City or across the country is that I'm doing, I'm testing for STIs and I'm talking about decreasing sexual risk, but within the context of having, creating a relationship over time. And so my ultimate goal is actually to communicate, but with, to communicate in order for them to be able to connect so that they can come back and feel like they can have the conversation over time about what's going in their life, on and in their lives. And so the goals of the relationship are to nurture, to empathize, to mirror, uh, and to build a more positive self. And from that standpoint, to influence behavior changes that will decrease risk. Just yesterday, uh, seeing patients Actually, Thursday, I um, was seeing patients um, in, in our busy family planning clinic. I saw a young man for the first time, and you could tell he was nervous about coming to, to the physician for the first time, especially about an STD. So I asked him, uh, why are you here? Uh, what are you worried about? And so he started uh, telling me what his concerns were, spe specifically about uh, potential contact to, to chlamydia. And at the end of the visit, which is one of my biggest compliments when a patient does this, he goes, Dr. Bell, I really want to thank you. I felt comfortable telling you what my story was. And I said, well, what was it about that? Because I, I knew I was giving this talk today. <laughs> so, so what was it about that that um, made you feel comfortable? And um, he said, it was your style. You asked the questions, but you really, for, and he goes, he did say, for better or for worse, and he didn't explain what that meant, you didn't react to whatever I said. And um, so, and on the, other, on the other point that I wanted to make earlier when I was uh, in Texas with the history taking, one of the things that I observed from the clinicians uh, when they were practicing their history taking was they would ask a question, and they, they may get the one word answer from the guy, but instead of asking him to tell me more, the idea is with, that they would go directly into their advice and sort of say, this is what you shouldn't do, or this is how you use condoms, or X, Y, and Z. It was just sort of this litany of advice in the history taking piece, and I, my, my thought and my um, advice to the clinician at the time is like, step back, ask your questions, get the full story, ask them to tell you more, ask them to um, elaborate, hold back your advice and get them to talk. And when you get them to talk, they'll tell you more and more of their story. At the end of the visit, after the physical, that's when you put it all together. And they will, if you give them advice too soon, they'll shut down. So sit back, do the genuine, hopefully genuine and non-judgmental style, and let them give you their story first. So the imp nurturing and empathetic approach um, gives clinicians strategies, it facilitates open communication, uh, and it hopefully it bypasses male stereotypes. <laughs> Another interesting story from yesterday, had a young man come, we have a linkage with, uh, one of our organization, one of an organization, organizations in the in New York that connects with guys that have just recently been incarcerated, and so we have sort of set aside certain number of appointments for those guys for Friday morning, and we've just recently sort of made that work. So one of the young men 
uh, came in yesterday and I was working alone as opposed to having the, my nurse practitioner and the family medicine doc that usually works in my service. And we, I started talking with him. This was his first physical in, I think, five or six years. And um, we went through, we uh, talked, we got to the physical exam. I asked him to get undressed, put on the gown. He was like, that's the first time anybody's ever asked me to get undressed. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> so so uh, we, um, then we got to the point of doing the, the genital exam. And at first he was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, we're about to examine the genitals, which is a normal part of our exam. And he said, that hasn't happened before as well. I said, okay, that's not necessarily great. Let's go forward. <laughs> so, so as soon as um, his, you know, he pulled down his underwear, glaring case of genital warts. And I said, have you noticed this? He said, yes, I have. I said, were you worried about this? He says, yes, <laughs> I was. I said, but you weren't, you didn't want me to examine you. I said, no, but I thought there was a blood test that you're going to do in the future that would have told me that I had this or not. <laughs> I said, well, let's talk. But um, so we ended up at the end of the uh, visit when we were sort of discussing what it was and what we were going to do, he starts crying. And this is a 22, 24-year-old 20, guy. And we just, you know, part of his past medical history uh, that we had talked about as well was he had was afraid of doctors he hadn't gone to he was delaying going to the doctor re, uh, four months ago because he had been hit and assaulted with a baseball bat his ear was had to be reconstructed and his knee was was also in had some bruise or uh, defect because of the uh, baseball bat and he starts crying because he got the HPV in front of me. And I said, I've forgotten his name, but the idea is, Joe, it's like, you've had far worse things happen to you. It's like, what's, what's the, why are you crying about this? Not, not, not in a way that was negative, but it's like, why are you showing so, so much emotion for this? And he didn't express it, but I let it go, but I said, there's, we can help, we can figure this out, we can get past it, we can work with it. And, but you know, you'll see me next week. Get, if you have any additional questions, let's go for it. But I think uh, getting back to the slide in a sense was sort of having a nurturing and empathetic approach, but the context for which many of these guys come in and that th what they've had as a part of their lives and how we work with them about sexual and reproductive health is important for and an important connection for them to have so that we can hopefully move them forward in their lives. Reflexive listening is an important piece. Uh, I've really enjoyed listening to you, insert whatever it was. This is sort of when you're giving your advice, giving advice at the end, a strategy, uh, but I'm feeling worried about X and uh, let's, let's talk about it. What do you see? Sort of maybe not using the uh, full motivational interviewing approach, but at least bringing in some concept that asks them what do they think about it, what are their strategies that they've thought through, what have they done, and it definitely puts a different twist on how the, especially the male will engage with you uh, over time. And rather than teaching or pre preaching, this allows uh, the young people to reveal their strengths, reveal what they've thought about, because most of them have given this thought about and applied something, some, some strategy. And so honoring what they've done and hopefully advising and influencing them either to try it again, because it was a successful uh, approach, or to modify their strategy uh, to do something different. One, there are about three slides that are coming up about sort of words that we can use and, and ways we can connect. And this is not just with males, but particularly with males that haven't gone to the doctor and sort of haven't connected and sort of helping them to understand that they aren't outliers. And so normalizing is one sort of concept. The guy saying, I didn't know I, you could get infected from having oral sex. And the response is, you're not alone. 
a lot of men haven't heard that, or a lot of young men haven't heard that. It sort of says, okay, we don't talk to guys for the most part about sexual and reproductive health. We have more, most of the literature, and most males when you, in qualitative interviews, uh, talk and say what they've learned about sexual and reproductive health. It's primarily from their families, but, and it's also the message, if you're going to do it, use this. And there's nothing about why you're using it, how you're using it, what you, you know, what you're trying to prevent. Everyone knows it's sexually transmitted infections, but then what the sort of details of that are, aren't discussed at all. And so I think it's important for guys to know that most guys haven't heard about it. You're not alone. Let's figure, let's, let's talk about some things. Selective attention. So I picked some, up some condoms, but I haven't used them. All right. The, uh, but you picked them up. Great. No. When's the first time you're going to use it? <laughs> it's like, let's go for it. <laughs> um, reframing. I'm a jerk. Uh, I should have come here before the warts got so big. It's am amazing if we don't preach and if we don't advise too soon, how much you can hear them speaking to themselves about what they should have done and what they could have done. Uh, it's, it's, and you don't need to do it. <laughs> I, I feel I don't need to do it because I can just build on them, on what they're saying in a way to say, okay, I see you're feeling bad about yourself, but let's figure out about what, what you can do next to move your behavior in a different way in one, one way, shape, or form. I actually had a 27-year-old. My, my clinic goes up to beyond adolescence, but it goes up to age 35. Um, and so I had a 26 or 27-year-old call me one day and said, Dr. Bell, you've never told me not to do X. And I said, but you're 27. Why do I have to? <laughs> he goes, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so one way of reframing is you're angry with yourself for waiting, but you're not a jerk. You felt embarrassed like most people would be. It's, it's great you're here now. We can talk. So advise. When you work with youth, must move beyond telling them what not to do and re reinforce for them what to do, but in a way that engages them in the, in, in the conversation. Um, one of the strategies that I use particularly, and it's, I'm trying to figure out how to do more of the sort of positive approach, but it's still a risk base and it starts off uh, with risk, but it's about, um, most guys have heard about condoms, most guys may have even seen the condom demonstration, and they may have heard about STIs. But I, I found a powerful way to sort of engage them and said, what have you heard about sexually transmitted infections? And the herd is an important word in this concept because it saves face. You can hear anything, and that can be wrong. If you say, what do you know, then it's personal, and it's hard to be wrong. Uh, so what have you heard? And you could have heard it from anyone. And so you bring that out there. And you, I sort of ask them about what, what names of sexually transmitted infections have you heard about? And so they'll list and I'll add if they haven't, if they uh, start pausing. And then my next question to them is what, and this is trying to personalize it a little bit m more for males, what would a guy see or feel that would make them think they had an infection? And so then m many guys will say, well, I don't have that. It's like, that's not my question. <laughs> my question is what would a guy see or feel that would make him think he had an infection. And we'll go through each of the infections and sort of tease them out so that they understand what we're looking for when, when we were looking for it. And so sometimes p guys will go, oh, if there's chest pain or if there's this on my arm, it's like, no, that's, let's talk about sex. Unless you're doing, oh, one guy said something about an eye. Yes, you can get gonorrhea or chlamydia in the eye, so rare. But I said, unless you're doing something with your eye, <laughs> let's, let's stay below the belt. Um, so those are some key questions that I ask to sort of engage them. And then I'll ask them why, you know, how do you protect against them? And they'll bring up the condoms. What else does it protect against? Uh, unintended pregnancy. Uh, and then I'll say, so talk me through the steps of putting on a condom. 
And they'll say, what? <laughs> so so I, I'll usually grab a condom and give it to them. I said, talk me through the steps of putting on a condom. And invariably, they will go through many of the steps. The most, the usual one that they'll forget is looking at the expiration date. And so I sort of encouraged that. I said, before you open it, hold off. What are some numbers on the package that are important? Um, and so they'll go through it, open it up. They, my, my whole spiel, which I, um, many guys uh, sort of connect to because it ends up being funny and so blunt that they like it. Um, but the idea is, okay, you open it up, and I ask him about the tip. I said, what do you do with the tip? Some guys will start saying, it, saying they are pinching the tip without necessarily voicing it. So i like, you're doing something there. What is it that you're doing? And then they'll say, getting the air out or p pinching the tip. And they roll it down. And so they, they skip over the sex part because we can't talk about sex, right? So they skip over, and then they're right about pulling it out and tying it up. I was like, wait. <laughs> I was like, hold on. You just had sex. You're still inside. How do you pull out? And they're like, oh, I pull out, and I tie it up, and I throw it away. I said, no. How do you pull out? I said, do you, s and then if they don't, I said, S if they don't say anything, I'll say, well, do you use hands or no hands? And they, some say no hands. So I said, well, pull out a little bit and make sure you have the condom on before you, you uh, pull out. It's like, why is that important? And most of the time I'll ask why it's important for the pinching the tip, many different parts of it, so that they, under, they can voice the rationale or hear the rationale for it. Uh, and so pulling out, making sure the condom doesn't stay in is, isn't obvious for them after I tell them. Then I'll say, you know, many times I've actually had to pull out condoms. That is a sort of not a great phenomenon that I want to sort of be a part of, but as one young lady one Friday came in and said, you know, I need plan B. And she goes, by the way, I think the condom's still in. So obviously I had to pull it out, and I tell that story to guys so that they really see that it does happen, and they're like, you had to do that? <laughs> How? <laughs> so it's, it's some many times an amusing story, and it helps them connect to sort of why it's important um, to make sure they have the condom on them as they pull out. Um, let's change to the risk model in a sense, so taking sexual history. Uh, sort of, as we know, uh, taking a sexual history, we usually have some general considerations about starting off sort of impersonal or less personal and then going more to the personal piece. So unless they're, they're first, the first thing out of their mouth is, I think I have a uh, discharge, I really wouldn't start with sex as my first sort of topic. But if it's already there, obviously everything, everything's full game. Um, so chief complaint, history of present illness, and then sort of general medical inquiries, all the allergies, medications, everything we have to do for our JCO compliance for academic medical centers. Um, so then the uh, STDs are the five Ps, partners, prevention of pregnancy, protection from STDs, practices, and past history of sexually transmitted infections. For partners, these are the sort of the main questions. For some reason, the uh, CDC has changed their sort of mark to past two months as opposed to our usual in the past three, three months or 90 days. Not sure of the rationale, but. Um, and then it, in the past 12 months, how many partners have you had sex with? Is it possible that any of your partners have had sex with anyone else? Uh, what are you doing to prevent pregnancy? Uh, Open-ended question. Uh, teaching medical students, especially the first year medical students, when I'm doing lectures, they've it's drilled to them that they should have open-ended questions. And I get that, but I think we, our message should be, there's sometimes reasons to have closed-ended questions, <laughs> and then you open in to get more of the story. But closed-ended questions actually are beneficial. <laughs> so uh, protection from STDs. What do you do to protect yourself from STDs and HIV? Another open-ended question. I usually start off by asking guys more about are you using condoms? Uh, when, you know, do you use condoms f uh, for oral sex, vaginal sex, and anal sex? Um, and then to understand your risk of STDs, I, that tagline I personally don't use, but this is what's in, these are the uh, questions in the guidelines. Um, I need to understand what kind of sex you have had recently and 
they explain um, the different types of sex, which is great. We have a uh, vignette on that, <laughs> or at least a question on that. So this is will be the answer, or at least one part of the answer. Um, so condom use, if you've used condoms, then ask them about delineating if they've used condoms for each and every one of the pra their sexual practices. Uh, what many of the guys will say, I use condoms 100% of the time. It's like, great. But do you use it for oral sex? Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, well, so, and I'll just explore and say that, you know, obviously you can get other infections uh, or infections from oral sex as well. Uh, have you ever had an STD? Um, have any of your partners had an STD? Uh, and then asking uh, specific questions to identify HIV and hepatitis risks. So where I would say that I go beyond the prevention counseling is talking about relationships. And we are usually, our model is usually to ask only about abuse, uh, abusive relationships and, uh, but, I would argue that we should broaden the concept about relationships so that we can have better conversations about what healthy relationships are. Um, what I have found the most, uh, many of my segues, particularly with uh, the young adults, but someti sometimes with the uh, adolescents, is that when they come in and have concerns about dysfunction, so not actually getting an erection or premature ejaculation, but particularly not getting an erection, ask, uh, obviously we should ask about what's going on in the relationship. And sometimes you'll find out about what's not going well within the relationship. But interestingly, uh, I find that guys will say, well, something wasn't right about the circumstance. Uh, something wasn't right about the relationship. Something wasn't right about uh, where we were or what we were doing. I said, and I ask them, say, so what do you think about that? And what's in, important, I think, for us to help guys understand is that although we say that their two guys have two heads um, and think with own more, mostly one below their waist, it does relate to our emotions and to our feelings and what we think about. And I having that help helping guys to understand the connection between their emotions, their relationships, and their sexual functioning is an important piece that we don't talk about, and it's sort of the norm for guys to think they should be able to function regardless of anything uh, that's happening in their lives, and the, regardless of the stress, regardless of the relationship, regardless of the situation. And I think it's important for them to understand that they are human. This is a, an emotional and a intimate uh, context, and they do have to feel safe and close to someone, for the most part, to have sex and have a good sexual relationship. I also ask them, like we ask females about whether they've gotten pregnant and what's happened with their pregnancies, and I don't go into all the details of uh, whether they've, you know, they think their partner's had an ectopic pregnancy and a or things like that. But at least I ask them, have you ever gotten anyone pregnant? And more than anything, it's, it's about creating a space for them to self-reflect on what's happened in their life, life uh, in a sexual and reproductive health way. Um, so have you ever gotten anyone pregnant? If yes, what happened with the pregnancies? And then do you want or plan to have kids in the near future, in the next future? And are there any concerns about your fertility? One, the reason I bring that last question in, it, particularly for uh, late adolescents and early adults, young adults, we, I, th I think an unanticipated consequence of our messages about if you don't use a condom, you will get pregnant, has backfired to some degree because if they don't use a condom and they don't get pregnant, they think that something's wrong. And sometimes they'll keep trying and trying again until something happens. And so in order to sort of help minimize that, it's like asking about whether they have concerns about fertility because you can have a great conversation. It's like you didn't get pregnant that time. 
great? Do you, you know, what's, you know, do you want to, what's going on in your life in that context? Um, but it doesn't mean that anything's wrong. Uh, that, and sort of helping them to think through what it really means to get pregnant, sort of the timing of it if you want to go into that. I actually at times go into the timing of uh, fertility for females and when uh, sort of the, f in s whatever we can say about the three days or four days that's sort of the most optimal time, because it gives them a context, not that I'm trying to encourage them not to ha use a condom for pregnancy, but it gives them a set of knowledge, a knowledge base that it isn't sort of an absolute any time I have unprotected sex that I'll get someone pregnant. And there's not anything wrong with me physically or in my sexual and reproductive health that I need to be worried about in that context. All that being said, we really would like them to be safe and healthy overall. So it's sort of putting it into context about um, using condoms or uh, birth control as, as necessary. We spoke a little bit about this uh, before, but ha do you have any concerns about premature ejaculation? Young guys do, uh, particularly young adults, but adolescents do as well. Do you have any concerns about delayed ejaculation? Do you have any concerns about getting or, ma or maintaining an erection? I already went through this with you. <laughs> and I, I recently completed um, a study that I'm analyzing now, uh, analyzing the data about understanding the knowledge and attitudes and the intent to receive emergency contraception by males. Um, and so it's a little provocative on many levels, uh, but the idea is that if we don't involve males uh, and we want to have them be responsible, uh, we should sort of talk to them about all the avenues. Many of the guys uh, in Washington Heights, particularly that of where the our clinic is, many of them know about uh, emergency contraception and have had some experience with it in the past. So it's an interesting piece. What in our Title X funded clinic, we are actually um, it, giving advanced emergency contraception for the guy in case the condom breaks so that we can um, push the mark at least to say, you have it on board, you know, don't. It, we're working, our next step is to sort of think through what it means in the context of a negative relationship and possible coercion, but overall, uh, when we are in, our adolescents are in quasi-healthy relationships and they have a male be knowledgeable about emergency contraception is uh, uh, having dual support for decreasing uh, unintended pregnancies. More to come on the knowledge uh, my study about the uh, knowledge of and intent of emergency contraception among males. M a work in progress for me is sort of help having conversations about paternity uh, with males. Uh, with our new, obviously, the welfare reform law laws that started in the late 90s and the ideas about um, garnering wages uh, and sort of garnering the wages uh, of males, if they're the fathers, uh, helping them to understand what unintended pregnancies and having kids um, will mean for them in their near future, I, th I think there's something at least to acknowledge to them and let them know this is what will happen. And so my thought is, and I'll, the, my hypothesis is, is that it will have some, an, a thought about what it means to have one night stands uh, particularly unprotected one night stands, because that person you may not you m may not want a relationship with over time, but if you have a kid, you're going to be connected to them, and sort of helping them to sort of think through those, as well as guys who understand they're not in the healthiest of relationships, and to think through what that means for them to continue and possibly bring a kid into the relationship. I'm sure many of you have had experiences that when you talk to your, the young people about their relationships and they say that it's um, not going well, but they're still thinking about having a kid uh, in the relationship is sort of mind-boggling. It's like, 
the kid's not going to change it. It's actually going to make it worse. <laughs> it's like it's so many more stresses in the relationship. Um, apropos of pleasure, is still a work in progress as well, sort of under, trying to figure out what the right questions are, what does it mean. I, in a context, the pleasure questions are embedded in the function questions, but not necessarily. Uh, it has, it's not worded in a pleasurable sense. It's more worded in the, are you functioning well? But I think that there are, are more ways and better ways to explore that uh, question. But um, I'm not sure if there's a lot of literature about males and asking the question, um, and I th that that's future, future work for us all. So ending, I would say, as I started before, one of the contexts is for us to connect with males because most males aren't coming in, but if the word gets out that they're getting respectful care, um, many other guys will come to your clinic because of the word of mouth. Um, m many of the guys in the young men's clinic at least 20 or 30 percent of the guys in the young men's clinic come because another male has been there and has told them it's a good place to come. And it may be brothers, it may be cousins, it may be other friends. Sometimes they'll come in packs. It's like, oh, my, my, one guy, one, I, this is, happens more often than not. Uh, one guy will say, somehow find out one of his friends wants to get tested. And so uh, he says, well, I told him about the young men's clinic, so I came with him. <laughs> so, so I'll get three, two or three guys that are friends to come in and get tested together. It brings another uh, thought about going to the bathroom together for females. And <laughs> anyway, um, so a connection with a respectful health center and a trusting relationship with a clinician skilled in communication can be important co components of a strategy that averts crises and helps a young man develop to his potential. We have a special role as caring adults who interact repeatedly and confidentially with young people throughout adolescence. When we have an ongoing relationship with a young person, we create a safe space for him to turn in crisis. Thank you.